Good morning, everybody. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 17. If you're visiting with us, we've been working our way through the book of Acts for the better part of a year at this point. Today we come to Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. A very eventful section of the book of Acts. And a lot of crossover with our Sunday school from this morning, as, as you'll come to see. Uh, just want to get, invite those of you who haven't come to Sunday school to, to make that a priority. This is uh, such a good um, group of classes that we are going through together, working through together, the marks of a healthy church. Um, growing up, I always heard uh, this thing called Bible thumping. Bible thumping. Well, this is probably going to be one of those sermons that I could be credibly accused of being a Bible thumper, whatever that means. Um, Acts 17, verses 1 through 15. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. This is God's word, profitable for teaching and correction and reproof and for training in righteousness that the people of God might be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you, as we eat the food of your holy word. Fill us, sustain us, encourage us, challenge us, embolden us, free us, heal us. Let us see Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, growing up in the church as a pastor's kid, my dad had an office behind the sanctuary. And like any pastor's office, it had books, it had pictures, and other meaningful objects, as most pastors have in their offices. But my dad had something that was very unusual hanging in his office. It was something handmade for his 25th anniversary at the church. Uh, it was this wooden platform mounted against the wall, and hanging from this platform 
was a heavy piece of metal shaped almost like a football. It was hanging by a string. And I remember asking my dad about it, and he said, well, that's a plumb line. It's an ancient tool used even still today to measure vertical straight lines. When one is building a home, for example, it's used to make sure that the the structure is straight up and down and not crooked. The metal pulls down on that string just with gravity to create a perfect right angle. It creates a standard of what is upright. Well, that's interesting, I said, but why is this ancient measuring tool in your office? I'm not sure if the conversation went exactly like this. And he explained, well, because the plumb line is in the Bible, my dad said. It's a metaphor for God's holy and righteous standard, especially in the prophets. God uses the plumb line as a symbol of what he expects of his people when he calls them to be upright to know Him, to follow Him, to be wise, to be just. Yes, the winds of change may come and go. Kings and prophets and nations and cultures will come and go. But the plumb line remains fixed. As we move ahead into Acts 17 today, Paul and Silas visit two synagogues, one in Thessalonica and the other in Berea. Two synagogues that couldn't be any more different. In the first synagogue, the apostles open up the word of God. Some believe it, but most adamantly and even violently reject it. But the second synagogue is different. They receive Paul and Silas' teaching with all eagerness. Why? What's the difference? Why did synagogue number two react so differently from synagogue number one? Well, they had different plumb lines. For synagogue number one, the synagogue in Thessalonica, the plumb line, the standard, the criteria by which all things were judged was their traditions. Paul and Silas' teachings about Jesus defied the status quo. But for synagogue number two, the synagogue in Berea, their plumb line was God's word. God's word was their standard, their criteria, their straight line for determining what's true and what's false and what's right and what's wrong. The Jews in Berea were a people of the book. Congregation, today we're going to be learning about God's call on all of us to be Bereans, to be people of the book. In four points, we'll be thinking about how God's Word is and remains our North Star, how and why the Bible and the Bible alone, not passing fads, not what others expect of you, not the nostrums of your tribe, not even your pastor. Now, how the Bible alone remains our only infallible and true and sufficient authority, our perfect plumb line when it comes to life, when it comes to relationships, and especially living before the face of God. There's four things we're going to think about today when it comes to God's Word. First of all, the clarity of God's Word. Second, the gravity of God's Word. Third, the authority of God's Word. And four, the sufficiency of God's Word. So first of all, the clarity of God's Word. So after spending most of chapter 16 in Philippi, Paul and Silas depart. Remember, they're on their second missionary journey, but they don't leave Macedonia. They stay there in the same region that they have been. They just travel to a different city in the region, a much larger city, actually the capital city of Macedonia, a city that's still there today, by the way. It's called Thessalonica. Remember, Paul, friends, is a church planner. And as you'll notice, for the rest of Acts, 
Paul's church planting strategy is what some have called a key center's strategy. In other words, instead of hitting every village, every single suburb with the gospel directly, Paul makes a beeline for the big cities. Not that those villages and small towns don't matter, but with his limited time and resources, Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, deemed it wisest to target major metropolitan hubs with the gospel and then let the news of that gospel message bleed outward into the smaller villages. Not a bad plan. So Paul and Silas head to Thessalonica And as per their custom, they immediately head into the synagogues to open up God's word and reason with their fellow Jews, explaining and proving from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Christ, that it was necessary, biblically speaking, for him to suffer and die and rise again. The pulpit at my last church had a little message taped to the pulpit, a message only the preacher could see. It was taped right here on the top. It's the request of those Jews, or those Greeks rather, in John chapter 12 when they come to Philip and they say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Well, that's very much what Paul and Silas do here. As Jesus did on the road to Emmaus, remember that That story in Luke chapter 24, Paul and Silas open up the scriptures to their countrymen and they show them Jesus. I was talking to one of my kids recently. He was asking a lot of those, how do I know type questions? How do I know the Bible's true? How do I know this stuff is credible? Good questions. And I walked him through, you know, some of the standard arguments about why the Bible's trustworthy, why Christianity is worth believing, including the presence of Christ in the Old Testament. The fact that over a thousand prophecies are perfectly and plainly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There's no book in existence that can boast of maybe five prophecies that have been fulfilled, let alone a thousand. It's a very helpful tool, friends, not just in bolstering our faith, but in evangelism, especially with our Jewish friends. This is very much how my Christian family members have shared the faith with my Jewish family members. Even my mom, this is how she came to faith as a Jew. I probably wouldn't be here today if a Christian hadn't come along and shared Christ with her from the Old Testament. Friends, as Reformed people, we confess and we celebrate what we call the perspicuity of Scripture. The fact that it's clear when it comes to understanding all that we need for life and godliness. Not that everything in the Bible is easy to interpret, that's not what we mean. But when it comes to the central tenets of Scripture, how we can know God, how we can be saved from our sins, when it comes to who Jesus is and what He's done for us, the Bible doesn't hide the ball. No, from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation, in the prophets, in the poetry, in the writings, every genre, every book, every page makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners. The clarity of God's Word. That's the first thing we see here. Second, the gravity. The gravity of God's Word. So the apostles go and they share the Gospel in Thessalonica, in the synagogue. Some believe, including a great many Greeks and a few leading women. But the Jews were jealous, verse 5. They were jealous of the fanfare Paul and Silas received. So what do they do? They form a mob and set the city in an uproar. They attack the home of Jason. Jason was Paul and Silas' host, demanding Jason bring out his guests, 
Just a wild scene. This angry mob ends up dragging Jason before the city officials, accusing the Christians, among other things, of turning the whole world upside down. It's amazing, you know, how uh, despite their obvious attempt at hyperbole and deception, nevertheless, how profound, how truthful, how insightful this angry mob is. Think about that. What they mean as a slight is actually profoundly and beautifully true. And it also gets to the heart of why they're upset, if you think about it. Because the fact is, in turning the world upside down, the apostles actually were setting things right side up again. As James Boyce comments, the world had already been turned upside down by sin, so by turning it upside down again, they're actually setting it right. And that's something that these men didn't want. As I mentioned last week, we're all institutionalized. We like the prison food. We like the cell. We like the, the crookedness of this present evil age. Everything since Adam is upside down. And to be honest, we kind of like it that way. And what the gospel does is bring everything back into balance, back into harmony. God's word, that great plumb line, sets everything straight again. In other words, God's word has gravity, not just in, in its severity, its enormity, but also in the fact that it changes the laws of gravity itself. The laws of the curse, the laws of this evil age, what is true, what is right, what is good, all of it goes topsy-turvy. That's the thing about God's Word, friends. It's not just pious advice. It's not just good counsel that we use to live happier lives. It's not just a litany of truth claims or historical facts. No, it is a world disturber. It is a seismic prison shaker, as we heard last week. It's designed to leave you and to leave the whole world not just different, but new. Everything is crucified and resurrected in the image of Christ. Everything. It's designed to transform our securities, our confidences, our relationships, our emotions, our goals. It leaves nothing the same. Everything goes topsy-turvy before the Word of God. And folks don't like that. That's one thing we see in Acts, and just by experience, again and again. Some, yes, hear the Word and believe, but the majority do not. They adamantly resist it, even violently so. People who despise the truth, people who don't want it proclaimed, who don't want to be held accountable, who don't want their evil deeds exposed, usually find a mob, a tribe, an echo chamber to back them up. If you don't like what's going on, you're going to list others to your cause. This is something we see all throughout the Scriptures. And even throughout the church to the present day. And that's because, again, even they sense the weight, the gravity of God's Word. It's a total game changer. It's a world disturber. God's Word shakes the status quo of sin, and those tremors are really, really hard to bear, even for us. But it's what we need. There's a reason that God compares unbelief and stubbornness to being asleep. Again and again in the Bible. And meanwhile, belief, coming to one's senses, knowing and trusting the Lord as being shaken awake. 
rousing me from our sleep. And what a mercy that is when we are shaken awake. It's a mercy. I love that verse in the prophet Haggai. It's actually uh, one of those verses from Handel's Messiah. If David Moon were here, he could belt it out for us, no doubt. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The clarity of God's word, the gravity of God's word. Third, the authority of God's word. Now, why are these people so disturbed by the Word of God? Yes, it turns our world upside down. Yes, it shakes our priorities. It confronts us in our sin. But more to the point, it defies what's comfortable. Our traditions, our expectations, our rituals, our thought patterns and heart patterns and life patterns. Which, let's be honest, friends, has supreme authority in our lives. God's word at root is seditious. It's a challenge to the Caesars of our hearts. My daughter Ellen, she had her braces taken off recently. It was a joyful day to be free of all that metal and all that wiring going around her teeth, and to be able to now smile in the mirror with straight teeth. But her excitement was a bit dampened with the news that she's not totally free yet. Now she has to get a retainer. Because otherwise, her teeth will revert back to being crooked. Well, that's very much how it is when it comes to the power of comfort and ritual, friends. Yes, dietitians will come along in our lives and they will say, this is what's best to eat. This is what is best for the body. Philosophers will warn us that this way of thinking will lead to success, while this way of thinking will lead to ruin. Road signs, we're going to see a lot of them on the way home today, will say this is the safe speed. God's word, our confessions of faith, will say this. This is the holy and righteous path. This is what leads to lifelong, sustainable joy in the Lord. But like those teeth, we are prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. We gravitate toward crookedness. We want to supplant the authority of God with the authority of familiarity with comfort, with what we're used to. My friend Jonathan Clark used to tell me that culture eats truth for breakfast. Whether you're out in the world or in the church. Same thing. Everything can look great on paper. You can have access to all of the best information. You can have a game plan. You can have all of your New Year's resolutions mapped out in front of you. Um, You can have your church's mission and vision statement nailed down. You can have Presbyterian etched on your sign out front. We can be a people that subscribes to truth. But at the end of the day, in the final analysis, if truth doesn't find its way from the screen into our bones, from the sign into our hearts, then what's comfortable, what's easy, what's common, comfortable sins, comfortable securities, will always reassert themselves. Our Christ is a paper savior. This is why the apostles, especially Paul, warn us against this. They warn us against preserving tradition just for tradition's sake. Letting tradition 
Or what's easy be the plumb line instead of holding every thought captive to God's Word. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul speaks about this. And for him, there's three things at stake when we let traditions lead the way instead of God's Word. The first thing at stake is our freedom. Our freedom. Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. You see, for Paul, supplanting the authority of God's Word with tradition, any tradition, whether that's the accepted thought patterns and rituals and expectations of this world or in the church, when we let those things be our guiding principles, that's not freedom. That's captivity. That's slavery. We're shackled hand and foot by subjectivity, by fads, by feelings, by what's popular, by things that come and go. Our freedom is at stake, as well as the presence and power of Christ. That's the second thing that's at stake here. Paul tells us to not be taken captive by human tradition and not according to Christ, for in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. See what he's saying here? When we let preferences, traditions, likes and dislikes lead the way instead of God's Word, we don't just lose our freedom, we lose Christ. When we supplant the Word with something else, we forsake the Savior. We've chosen a false God, a lesser God, not the God in whom all deity dwells. Our freedom is at stake. The presence and power of Christ is at stake. Also, our growth in grace. In the same chapter of Colossians, Paul says that we are not to submit to human precepts and teachings, things that have an appearance of wisdom in promoting, listen to this, self-made religion, Things that are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, we are not to submit to man's word in how we honor the Lord. No, God knows what he wants. God knows how we can best know him and love him. He's made it very clear, so much so that anything less than that is self-made, do-it-yourself religion. It's what the reformers called will worship. In other words, you might have an appearance of wisdom. We might look very religious, performing this and that ritual, reciting this and that incantation, waving the flag for this and that cause. might have an appearance of wisdom. It might feel great. You might look very courageous in the eyes of your friends, but it's of no value, Paul says, in stopping the indulgence. Of the flesh. It doesn't help. Now, does this mean that traditions are all inherently bad? No. There are some traditions that we all have, especially as families that maybe don't even really make much sense, but are nevertheless life giving. They bind us together. My family has a tradition of eating chicken wings by candlelight every Halloween. Doesn't make any sense, but it's amazing. I'd highly recommend it. We look forward to it every year. It's not Halloween unless we have wings. Traditions are even good in the church. In fact, I'd say that traditions in the church are even necessary. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians, for example, to hold fast to the traditions that you have been taught. So traditions, habits, these are not bad or evil, but the moment 
This is the main point. The moment our traditions become our chief authority, when our traditions become traditionalism, when our rituals become ritualism, we've turned traditions into idols. Friends, church traditions are great, but only in so far as they bolster and they reinforce the word. They're supposed to be handmaidens to Scripture, not masters of Scripture. The same with our creeds and confessions, by the way. These documents, the things that we confess, are not meant to replace Scripture or even to rival Scripture. No, they're meant to exalt the Scriptures, to teach the Scriptures, to defend the Scriptures. You understand the difference? And the moment these positions are reversed, the moment that tradition trumps truth, we've chosen slavery over freedom. The fullness of comfort over the fullness of Christ. The appearance of godliness, but not the real deal. The clarity of God's word, the gravity of God's word, the authority of God's word, and finally, the sufficiency of God's word. Okay, so much for Thessalonica. Paul and Silas preach the word. It's violently rejected by the Jews there. And after a very narrow, middle-of-the-night escape, Paul and Silas flee 50 miles south to another town called Berea. And upon their arrival, as per their usual arrangement, once again they head straight to the synagogue. I mean, you have to admire the uh, tenacity, right? The sheer supernatural grit of these men. These men were almost murdered for doing this exact same thing the day before. But here they are doing it again. You can't stop these guys. They head to the synagogue in Berea, they open up the scriptures, and they proclaim Christ as they did before. Except here in Berea, things are different. Verse 11, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So three things happen here. The Jews in Berea receive the word eagerly. They examine the scriptures. And they examine the scriptures daily. In other words, they are very much, as we heard this morning in Sunday school, creatures of the word. They are people of the book. Meaning that the Bible, for them, wasn't just their supreme authority It was their supreme satisfaction. It was their sufficiency. Now, this is not a new thing. Berea here might seem like an anomaly, but it's really not. Now, the reason these Bereans are satisfied by the word is because that's what God had commanded. Going all the way back to the Exodus. For example, if you look at the reasons why God forbids the making of any carved image of himself, the second commandment, is because God didn't reveal his appearance. That's why. He says it over and over. And he didn't want Israel to be satisfied in something that he hadn't revealed. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, God reminds Israel that she saw no form of God on the day that the Lord spoke at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Or in Deuteronomy 12, God says that you shall not inquire about the gods of the nations, saying, how did these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. 
There's more places. This is a very common theme in the Old Testament. Over and over, God is drilling into his people's hearts and minds because we forget that his word alone is enough. It's fully sufficient. We don't need the revelations. We don't need a Joseph Smith or a Mary Baker Eddy. No, we have something better. We have something breathed out by God. Something profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the people of God may be, what does Paul say? Complete. Perfect. Equipped for every good work. We have the Word. This is why I love preaching through books of the Bible. What we call Lectio Continua preaching. As opposed to preaching, you know, what I think that you all need to hear. This way, God determines the preaching ministry of this church. God t- sets the topic. God is the cook. Not me. This way, if I come across a passage, friends, that I find very uncomfortable for me, or perhaps you find uncomfortable, I can't skip over it. I can't avoid it. God's Word won't let me. Now I have to preach it. Because that's what God has called us to hear, that we might be truly satisfied. God knows what satisfies us. This is why I'm elated to know that Our new interim pastor, Rick Downs, will continue preaching through Acts, picking up right where I'm leaving off. Because at the end of the day, friends, UPC is not about a pastor, whether that's me or Patrick or Rick. No, it's about something far more satisfying, something far more sustaining. It's about something that God has given us to make us complete, to make us perfect, something that will never leave us all of our days, and that is His Word. I love how the Apostle Peter describes the Word. It's like milk for a baby. On the one hand, It's everything that we could ever need. It supplies all that fatty, milky nutrition that we could ever need. And at the same time, without it, we starve. And the reason is, the reason the Bible is our milk, the reason the Bible has clarity and gravity and authority and all sufficiency, the reason for all the things that we've talked about today, friends, is because in the Word, in this Word, we see Jesus. The Bible is everything we could ever need, everything we could ever desire. The Bible is our perfect plumb line. Not because the Bible is our Savior. Not because the Bible died on the cross for our sins, but because the Bible shows us Jesus. Christian, let me ask you this. Do you delight in the Word of God? Does your mouth water to feast at the banquet of Jesus Christ? After all, it's there that we find something that we can't find anywhere else in the universe. True food and true drink, the bread of life, the living waters, it's there at the banquet of the incarnate Word. Christian, God did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, presenting Him as the true manna from heaven, the true water from the rock, the nursing mother of all filthy sinners. And if you want to know Him, if you want to see Him, if you want to hear Him, if you want this water, if you want this manna, if you want this milk, go to the Word. It's sitting on your lap. 
Don't turn to any substitute nourishment, which is what we, which is what I tend to do. Don't substitute the banquet of the age to come, the feast of Jesus Christ for something that this world offers, for something that you think is more important or more necessary or more sufficient. Don't substitute the divine plumb line for something that's crooked. Don't substitute the fleeting joys and the passing pleasures for the inexpressible joys and solid pleasures of the Word of God. Amen. Let's pray. O oh Lord, these are truths unchanged from the dawn of time. Help us to behold them afresh, to take hold of those solid joys and lasting pleasures found only in your word. Amen. Would you please stand and respond to the word we just heard by singing together.